What's up, family? Good morning. So yesterday, we did the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Today, we're continuing in chapter 6, when Jesus walks on the water. So let's just go ahead and get into it. i got some things I want to say. Uh, actually, you know what? I usually pray before I do these. I'm going to start out with a prayer, since I didn't do it before I hit record. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the breath that I have in my lungs. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to share your word with everyone. Lord, I just ask that you remove me and insert you, speak through me directly to the hearts of whoever is watching this. Even if it's just for one person, Lord, it's all worth it. So I just pray that you guide my words today and everybody who's underneath the sound of my voice, Lord, I just pray that you uh, cover them with your love and with your grace and with your mercy and in any area that they are lacking, strengthen them, uphold them with your righteous right hand, help them get to wherever they were going. If they're listening to this when they're in their car, get them back home safely to their families. And please just guide our steps and use our tongues the way that you want it to be used all for your glory, Lord. Thank you. We pray all this in the precious, holy and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, now we can get into it. Usually before I hit record, I, I pray, but for whatever reason, I didn't today. Um, all right. Chapter six, starting in verse 15, we're going to be in 15 through 21. Jesus walks on the sea. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, remember, this is right after he fed the 5,000, and there's a multitude of people there, and they're all probably freaking out in the best way possible, like, he's the prophet that Moses was talking about. He's the Messiah. He, he has to be our king. And so this is what Jesus is like. All right, I'm going to dip out. <laughs> Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat and went over the sea towards Capernaum. Now, note, Jesus is not with them. Jesus like dipped out. Uh, you know, he did his, his little Jesus disappearing act. But the disciples, now it's nighttime and they got back in the boat to go to the other side. And when it was already dark, Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat and they were afraid understandably they had never seen Jesus walk on water so and like really when I think about this I'm like how did they not know it was Jesus like who else do you think it is you ever seen anything like that before but we're human we're stuck in this flesh so after they've been rowing for three or four miles they've been tired from preaching or from helping Jesus uh, you know do his preaching that day and handing out all the food and then picking up all the food they're tired, they've been rowing, and then the storm happens, so they're probably not in their normal right state of mind. And they see this figure walking on water, and they were freaking out. <laughs> but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. <laughs> Notice how Jesus says, do not be afraid. This doesn't necessarily apply to this whole passage, but just as an in-general statement. Did you know that the Bible says, do not be afraid or do not worry or something along those lines 365 times? You think that's a coincidence that that's one time for every day of the year? 365 times, do not be afraid and 365 days because Jesus knew as humans, we're going to get scared. The disciples were scared when they were in this boat and they saw this figure. I mean, I would probably be freaking out too. Let's be real. <laughs> but he tells us, do not be afraid. And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And I want to point out that when he says, do not be afraid, that's not a suggestion or something that he thinks we should do. That's a command. He's saying, do not be afraid. Do not worry. So if you're someone who lives in fear or lives in worry, you're technically living in sin because you're disobeying Jesus's command to not worry. Now, of course, we're going to get scared at times. We're going to worry at times. We're going to stress out at times, but you shouldn't be living in that. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. If your uh, eternal salvation is set, what are you freaking out about for every single day? Pro tip, stop watching the news. But I digress. <laughs> All right, so you notice here how this passage doesn't talk about Peter walking on water. Now, only one of the Gospels, I believe it's Matthew, records Peter walking on water. So why is that? Like, like well, You would think that something that major everybody would record. Well, one of the ways that we know that the Gospels are firsthand eyewitness testimonies of the disciples who walk with Jesus is that they all don't say the same thing. 
Wouldn't it be a little sketchy if every single gospel recorded every single thing? Some of them overlap. Some of them share the same thing, but in you know different viewpoints. Um, that's because they were real human beings who were walking with Jesus and they had a different perspective and they're different people who write differently. Not to mention, uh, the gospels are written like 20 to 60 or 70 years after Jesus uh, rose from the dead and ascended. Now, I think it's safe to say that, well, A, paper was very expensive. To get some papyrus, to get something to write this in, it would have cost about the equivalent of a decent car these days. Like, that's how expensive it was. Papyrus, is it, like, it's not like we just had, you know, a go, go buy a stack of notebook paper and go write. So that's part of the reason. But also, when Jesus kept telling them that he was coming back, coming back, I think it's safe to say that these disciples were waiting on the imminent return of Jesus to come back. And then when it didn't happen, uh, you know, in the time that they thought, or they're starting to get older and they're like, all right, Jesus isn't coming. Um, things are getting crazy. Um, you know what? We should probably write down what we remember because this is very important. And if it's been 20 to 60 years after you've walked with Jesus, you're not going to remember everything. Not only that, we don't know like the relationships amongst the disciples, like who was closer with other. We know like the brothers, like Andrew and Simon were obviously close and James and John. But <laughs> like I think about in, uh, is it, I think it's later in the Gospel of John, John records that he outran Peter. Like He made a point to say that he outran Peter to the tomb. So is that like some sort of competition that they had amongst themselves? Was there some sort of like rivalry, like healthy sibling, in a sense, rivalry? And maybe John was like, I'm not telling everybody that Peter walked on water, but I'm going to tell them that, that I beat him in the race. You know, so like when I think about that, I'm like, maybe that's why he didn't record it. Um, but for whatever reason, it's not recorded in there. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And to me, it seems very clear that that actually makes for a stronger case that the Gospels were written by individuals and that they were all true because they don't all say the same thing. Like think of it like in the court of law. If you were in a, a court case and every single witness said the exact same thing about the specific color, the exact time, what the uh, you know weather was like, if everybody's testimony lined up, wouldn't that seem a little fishy? These are human beings who are recording what they seen. Of course, every word is inspired by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was bringing back to remembrance. But I just wanted to point that out. This is why I think that John doesn't record that he was walking on water. But in culmination of all that, I kind of went on like little tangents and stuff. The passage that we read here, we can see that, look, they immediately received Jesus into the boat and all their fears and worries immediately went away. They willingly received him. Do you willingly receive Jesus? And not only that, as soon as he got in the boat, they immediately were at land. That That's crazy. Like it was like all of a sudden, boom, Jesus helped them and now they're on land. And like the number one, I feel like a main point from this is that we always need to keep our attention on Jesus. Yeah, we're going to get scared. Yeah, we're going to get worried. But if we keep our focus on Jesus and trust his words when he says, it is I, do not be afraid, trust him. Don't be afraid. We're going to get scared at times. We're stuck in these, these flesh suits. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your focus on him. And although that this is not in this passage, when Peter did walk on water, he had his eyes on Jesus and he was walking on water. The moment that he looked away, the moment that he lost his focus on Jesus, he sank. And what did Jesus do? He rescued him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Focus on him. Do not be afraid. <sighs> And believe what he says. Man. Love you guys. See you tomorrow. Lord willing.